I don't know if Ron and Aaron is going to join us tonight. Uh, that's okay. Because I certainly have a lot of thoughts on this week's Parsha. Whoo! Uh, we're going to be reading Torah tonight. And this week's Parsha is Chukat. Okay? Chukat. Or or. Kukas, okay, also depends on your Ashkenazi or Sephardic pronunciations of, of certain words. So there's variations in Hebrew pronunciations, even amongst Jews. <laughs> Just like there are accents and dialects and, uh, you know, People in the South speak people different in the North, and the person from China has a, speaks English with a Chinese accent, and my grandmother spoke English with a Hungarian accent. You know, I mean, okay, so my fa- my grandfather, who was speaking Yiddish, the German said, oh my gosh, he was speaking Yiddish, and the Germans, <laughs> the German soldiers who nabbed him said, um, said to him, you speak uh, German, but with a Dutch accent. All right, so th- this is how, so there's variations, okay? And so I, I say, hukat, you say hukas. Tomato, tomato, potato, potato. Let's not call the whole thing off, okay? All right, so we have, so let's begin. Okay, we'll begin. We begin with a blessing before reading of the Torah. And I said, it's Chukas. What section of, is that? That's Numbers 20, uh, chapter 20, starts verse 1. Okay. So portions are generally, the parshas are generally just into divided into seven parts. Okay. All right. So. Barhu Atadanai Hambora. Praise be the divine source of all blessings, right? Okay. Baruch Adonai Hambarach Le'olam Va'et. So Baruch, okay. Baruch Adonai Hambarach. And then Baruch Adonai Hambarach Le'olam Va'et. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Ha'olam Asher Baruch Rabbanu Mikol Ha'amim Venat Almanu Et Torah To. Baruch Ata Adonai. Notain ha Torah. Blessed are you, Adonai, who is blessed. You know, blessed is Adonai, who is blessed now and forever, right? Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, sovereign of the universe, whatever this thing is, who has chosen us from uh, all these different people to uh, be able to discuss uh, the Torah and it was given us the Torah and blessed are you who gives the Torah because you gave it to everybody and thank you. So that's it. That's how you start. All right. So I do see that Rob Aaron has joined us and I have a lot to say. So um, I have, in fact, uh, so I'm going to start with a, a summary Okay, of this week's Parsha. And then uh, we're going to go into some deeper issues. Okay. All right. So the summary of uh, this week's Parsha uh, begins uh, with the laws of impurity. Okay. So I'm going to just summarize the Parsha real, real, real quick. Okay. Begins with the laws of impurity and touching the dead, and then it gives a formula for how to restore and purify. And, you know, we talk about purification rites uh, at the Temple of Mary and the Prophetess. You can check out the blog. We'll put it in the, in the, in the, in the chat. Anyway, um, the, the, um, there, then the, this famous formula, the red heifer formula is given. Uh, this is, uh, and, it, and it uses Mayim Chaim, which we're going to talk a lot about today. And I, I'm going to say that a lot of people talk about Mayim Chaim, you know, this is the flowing water, the water that has life, and it's, it's, it has to come from a spring or, or a fresh source that's flowing that, 
that cannot, that cannot, that cannot um, uh, dry up even once in, in seven years. And uh, sages use this maybe as a metaphor or reference to say that, you know, like truth is, is constant, right? You know, so if you believe something and it's supposed to be true, but like it changes, then it's actually not a real uh, objective truth. It's, it could be a transient truth for a limited time only, you know, right? So it's a circumstantial truth, but it's not necessarily objective truth. And, and so uh, that's a reminder for that, eh, you know, uh, it's very interesting. So um, then, uh, then after there's this formula is given, uh, there's, uh, 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 you're supposed to douse yourself with this, we're going to talk about that, and uh, 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 with this, you know, stuff and, and, uh, and you know, on day three and on day seven, and then you're supposed to go to a mikvah, which is a purification. And this is to cleanse yourself of the sarat, right? The contamination, the spiritual contamination that one can get from touching the touching of, of, of cor a corpse. Okay. Okay. So, um, these, these numbers three and seven are really kind of important and they're going to recur. You're going to see them as I talk about tonight's Parsha. You're going to, you're going to hear them. Uh, and they're going to stick in your mind. They're going to ring out to you. Okay. So, so let, let's, let's continue with the summary. Okay. So in this, in the Parsha, Miriam dies. Okay. What do you know? the Jews complain that, uh, uh, because there's no water. And, and without water, right, without water, they can't wash away impurity. So like, it's a big mess, right? Because now you have no water, right? You're running out of water. You know, people are going to start dying. If you start dying, then people are going to have to start handling corpses. If you have to start handling corpses and you don't have Mayim Chaim, that you access to purification, you can't purify yourself. If you can't purify yourself, you can't get into the temple. If you can't get into the temple, you know, this, this is, you can see like, this is the whole world is now coming to an end. All right. So God, uh, the people freak out, right. You know, and, and, you know, like, and the, you know, and, God tells Moses, all right, okay, okay, gather, gather everybody with the staff and go and talk to the rock. And, and sages talk about this, this rock to which they're referring to is the, the rock of St. Miriam's uh, well, okay? The rock of Miriam, okay? Um, you know, possibly, I don't know. It's a bit, we'll see. So Moses and Aaron, you know, they do that. They're supposed to go talk to the, to the rock, but Moses takes it upon himself to actually hit the rock he hits the rock, right? And not, uh, he was not instructed to do that. And it appears that he did it um, kind of rather than uh, it happening through the power of God. Like, you know, he is, you know, he makes this incantation. He, we're going to talk about he hits the rock. And, then, and because of that, he's not allowed to, uh, you know, enter Israel. And, uh, and, um, and a lot of say just talk about that. This means that intentions are almost or more important sometimes than appearances. I don't know if I agree with that. Uh, I'm going to put something in the chat. You can't always uh, uh, control appearances, in my opinion. Uh, you, you can, you're only, because you're only getting one view, right? You're only getting one view. Anyway, let's get back to the story as you look at that, uh, in the chat. Now, the Adamites don't allow the Jewish people to pass. Uh, so this is why they take this long way around. And this is why they spend the 40 years in, in, in the desert. Okay. So, so now in, I'm just summarizing, still getting there. Uh, Aaron, remember him? Passes away, you know, Moses' brother passes away on Mount Hor. Okay, uh, so uh, he 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 bites it. Okay, and then the Jews are attacked by what appear to be Canaanites, but are 
are, are, are actually Amalekites and uh, they pray to God and uh, they're saved. Wow. Uh, big surprise there. You know, it's a gripping story. Okay. Um, okay. Then the Jews get fed up with the manna and once again begin to complain. Okay. And God and 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 God sends a plague, a plague of fiery serpents. Okay, lots of death happens, okay, and you know, people are upset, and God then tells Moses to create a stick, uh, you know, around which there is a copper snake at the top of it wrapped around it okay and we're gonna put a huge pin in in that one for for sure okay so think think about that for just a second and where you might have seen that symbol before and you know thought so anyway so all we this is a summary still all the people everybody mourns for Aaron and, and this is interesting because the sages make a law, a point that, that uh, only the men more, more mourned when Moses passed away. And this is because Aaron was a peacemaker. He would go around making peace between men and women. And, and he was very well, uh, well, uh, well respected. In, in, uh, and, uh, and Aaron, uh, well, it's interesting. Now, Miriam, they don't mention the Israel mourning for her. And it's because they don't have time because they don't have time because they're th she dies. And now the water has dried up. They're thrown into this state of panic. OK, they're thrown into this state of panic. They don't have time for this. They're, oh, my God, there's a crisis. So it doesn't you know. So now two kingdoms go to war. Again, we're summarizing the part. So two kingdoms go to war against the, the Jews who are traveling to the land of Israel. We win. You know, they're, they're, we sing a big song. And, uh, you know, we thank God for helping them and there's more, but we have a very limited uh, period of time uh, tonight. So um, I, 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 I have to move on. So uh, because I have a lot of thoughts on this week's Parsha, that's the summary. Okay, That's pretty much the summary. I have a lot of thoughts on this week's Parsha and what the Torah is telling us. Okay, first, let's talk about the title, Hukha. Okay, or Hukha, as I already told you before, right? What is that? What is that? What is that? What is that? Well, that 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 word, that word comes from the three types of laws. We've talked about them before in the past, right? There's one type that's like a testimonial, like it's, it's an observance, like a, 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 like a celebration, like Passover, like you're commanded to, to observe something like Passover. So we'll put the link to Passover if you don't know what Passover is in the, in the, in the book. Okay. Um, and then there's another one, right, that's like, you know, sensible, moral, you know, like pretty obvious, like don't steal, don't murder, you know, like universally agreed upon ethics, uh, I would say, you know, uh, commandments that make sense. And then there's this third group, this third group of I don't know why what we do what we do. I, I don't know. We were just told to do it. OK. And uh, we don't have to know why. And. I'll tell you why. This is what what is what we do, because this is who we are, and we do what we do, and this defines us as a as a people, and that's what's good enough for us. This is we. This is this is what we're told to do, and we're told to stick a, a serpent a, made of copper on a, on a on a on a post, and 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 that is why. I don't know. Make doesn't make sense to us but it's part of our tradition and it, it unifies us as a people and um and so we can recognize uh you know each other right and uh because we have some uh some some commonalities right these are just you know the rules that we follow by being jewish all right so these are the hukat or the hukas okay this is the that that's that that word okay so i'm gonna we're gonna we start we're gonna, now i'm gonna go into a little bit more detail okay also i have some you know okay so we start with this whole ritual for 
for purity, okay, after touching uh, a dead corpse. Okay. Fascinating, okay, that's, wow, okay. A chukat. Let's read the chukat. This chukat is, uh, nine, I think, 1916, uh, is that right? Oh, yeah. Oh, did I say it begins? I'm sorry. I said it begins on 20 verse 1. I, I meant 19 verse 1. So, sorry. I, I said I might, might have, I can't remember if I made that mistake earlier. But uh, if I said 20 before, I meant 19. 19 one. Okay. And so, um, let me cor correct myself. Forgive me. I have sinned. Oh, my goodness. Um, so, um, um, uh, so uh, uh, 19, 1 through uh, 6, let's read it. Hashem spoke, speaks to Moses and Aaron saying, this is the decree of the Torah, which Hashem has commanded saying, speak uh, to the children of Israel and they shall take uh, to you a completely red cow. We've all heard of, ooh, wow. Which is without blemish and upon which a yoke has not come, has not been placed. And you shall give it to Elazar the, the Cohen, that's Aaron's son. Okay. And he's going to take it outside of the camp and someone shall slaughter it in his presence. Okay. Elazar the Cohen shall take some of its blood with its forefinger and sprinkle some of its blood in front of the tent of meeting seven times. Okay. Seven times. Oh, huh. And then someone shall burn the cow before their eyes its hide and its flesh and its blood with, with its dung, they shall burn. And the Kohen shall take cedar wood, hyssop, crimson thread, and shall throw them into the burning of the cow. Okay. The Kohen shall immerse his clothing and then immerse themselves in the water. And, you know, da, 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 da. we're, we're going to talk about that. But, oh, my goodness, cedar wood and hyssop, and red string. Well, kuhasheni, and cedar, and hyssop, I think I touch upon all of these things in the temple of, of, of Miriam. Uh, and there's a reason that kuhasheni is associated with the evil eye. There are, there are many, uh, many reasons, right? Rachel, is, is one with the string, right? And of course, and you know, the, the, and and Miriam. Miriam is also very anti evil eye and also the red string, uh, uh, you know, and uh, this, so, you know, she's a very important figure for for many reasons. She, she died. Let's, let's just get, let's hang tight for a second and say she dies, there's no water. And I want to talk about the mysticism of of Miriam. Okay, there's these three there's these three droughts that happen, and they af affect the Jews over this forty year journey that they take out of of Egypt. Okay, and let's talk about each of them because Miriam plays a very interesting role. Okay, wait, the three of them. Okay, <laughs> okay, there's the first, the second, and the third. The third of we just is her death. We just talked talked a little bit about that. So let's go. Let's go to the let's, before even actually we go to the first. Let's back up. Let's back up. We'll talk just a second, a little bit more about P Miriam and water. And uh, so we're introduced to her, Miriam, this character. Right, she's standing at the Nile. Right, that's what we're actually watching over her brother Moses. Okay. Uh, she can do nothing about it, so she has to just keep faith, right, which is certainly a symbol of Miriam. She keeps optimism, optimism, and faith. So she, she had faith that the universal deity would care for Moses, but she stood by at this, at this river. So boom, she's associated with, with, with water. Okay. Now again, all right, so she brings the tambourine right with her. And they're running out, right? Remember, that's what we're talking about, the tambour. So they're running out. And again, oh my God, they're confronted with this huge wall of water. 
and it's Moses and Miriam and and they stand together and like you know having faith the, again like Moses and, uh, like Miriam with her eternal optimism the water divi divides right that's why she's got the damn perfume they run across okay they run across and and wow yeah whoa okay right so so there you go she's indirectly kind of involved again okay so so two days after they leave egypt so it's the third day okay moses they're running out of water so i said this is the first drought they start running out of water most there's panic moses finds an oasis and it has bitter water, okay? It has bitter water, and he touches it with his staff, and the water goes from bitter to potable, okay? Even sweet, even, okay? Now, you don't know about this, probably. Maybe, I maybe you do, I don't know. But uh, about there are some Hebrew words here encoded. There's a code here. And tonight, I'm gonna reveal some Kabbalistic code. That's here, okay? Miriam is here, okay? I'm gonna show you where, okay? The second time that there's this drought, okay? One, two, the second time that there's this drought, there's, there's a water crisis, okay? And Moses taps the rock with his staff, okay? And, and, and he strikes it, right? And, and, and the water, uh, springs, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, he's instructed to strike the, sorry, I take it back. He asks God to, what to do. I got, I got conflated. He asks God what to do. God tells him, go to this rock, hit it. Tells him, hit it, hit it, hit it. No, hit he it. doesn't say hit it. He doesn't I, say this hit is, it. No, we're getting to the third time. He, we haven't gotten there yet. This we haven't gotten there yet. Where the third time is where he doesn't tell him to hit it. I'm getting there. This is where he does hit it and, and it becomes the well of Miriam. Okay. Ooh. So uh and in that time, there's there's actually I'm gonna read you uh some of that portion. Now uh, so in that story, Miriam is not there, but I'm gonna reveal a Kabbalistic secret about about. That she does, she's there. That about he lifts his arm up and touches the rock. He lifts lifts up his staff. That's the words. He lifts up his staff. I, I don't know if he touches the rock. Aaron might be right. Rob, Aaron, I don't want to disrespect. I think the, the most important thing is he's told to go Mer at this time, and he's told this is a second crisis. He's told to lift up his staff. Okay. All right. So. 40 years go by, and now there's no water crisis. They're rolling around with this rock, right? And Miriam dies. There's no water. And like I told you again, the people are going to die. There's a big crisis. There's no Mayim Chaim. You can't purify yourself. Oh, what a big mishpocha, big problem. And in that moment, God tells Moses to go and to uh, speak to the rock. And this is the big incident then he loses his privileges over, and it's in Numbers uh, chapter 20, verse 10. And there's, again, a secret presence of Miriam's name here hidden away. And if you allow me to explain, I'm going to go to 2010. Moses took the staff before Hashem, and, uh, and he commanded him. Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation before the rock. And he said to them, listen now, O rebels. He's talking to all the, the people who are fetching. Listen now, O rebels. Shall we bring forth water for you from this rock? And then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock with his staff twice. Abundant water came forth and the assembly and their animals drank. Okay, and then Hashem says to Moses and Arian, you know, you didn't believe in me, you didn't have faith, you know, um, you know, 
you know, da da da. So again, I'm going to tell you a secret that Miriam is found here even after death. And, and we'll talk about it. Miriam is spelled Mem, Reish, Yud, Final Mem. And without the vowels, there are three other words that are spelled like this in this, in this manner. Okay. The first one is the word bitter. Remember, Miriam, uh, I mean, Moses, he, he Mara. turns to Mara. That's right. That's right. If you pronounce it one way, right? So, so it's used in, the, in uh, and the other one is in the second time is lift up, is in the words lift up, Yari. Lift up, okay. Uh, that and, and and the third time is in the word where he's he Moses is talking to the rebels and says, "Here, O rebels." The word for in, in that case, Hamarim, Hamarim, is a different variation of Miriam. So without the without the vowels, which is remember, Torah is written before the vowels were standardized. Okay. In this context, this is a, this is the mystery. Okay, so in a way, in a way, I'm not saying he is. I'm saying you you can interpret this theoretically a, a little bit different about what he's actually saying. All right. So maybe he strikes the rock at this time. He's sad because he's saying you know he's missing Miriam. I don't know, but either way, I don't know his motivation. But either way, he does that and. God, you know, that's not a chukas, a chukat. That is not in the instructions. What God told him to do was something different. Okay, that's, and, and, and he may have given off the wrong appearance. Okay, like and I already said, but whatever. But for this, he's, you know, a lot of scholars say this is, you know, intentions are important. And, and I, I do. Uh, appearances are important too, as much as you can control them. Okay. So, all right. Uh, let's get to, you know, the Edomites, the you know, blah, blah, blah. blah. I, I'm going to make get, get to another thing. Okay. The Jews get like, fed up. We've, we've got the summary, right? But, you know, I, 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 they take the long way there's around. Also another, there's also another word um, that spells it, that, that is used, Hamorim. Mm -hmm. Amora, Amora is a teacher. So mm -hmm. Amora is a teacher, right? So what's interesting is there's disobedient ones, which is Hamorim, and then there's the teacher. So I think there's a link between. <laughs> I mean, we could be there's a clear link between disobedient ones and teachers all the time in school, yeah. right? There's a teacher, and there's always a disobedient. You can't have this a teacher without disobedient ones. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Away. Yeah. right. But then, on the other hand, um, you can't have, you can't really have a teacher. Okay, well, let me put it to you this way: you can't have a teacher without having a disobedient child in the classroom. Also, you can't have a teacher without having a disobedient child who needs to be taught. So there's the in, in the essence of having a teacher means that there's someone or an entity or something that needs a lesson. Needing a lesson meaning you is you don't know the lesson, and that meaning you're not following the ways. And so a teacher needs to teach you. Mm -hmm. So that's just that's just one one thing. That, uh, absolutely. That yeah, that's uh, yeah. All right, phenomenal. So the Jews, they get, they get, let's get back to this thing. But this is another interesting point that I told us uh, that we were going to get back into, which is that, you know, the Jews get fed up with the manna and they start complaining. And then God sends them this, this, this plague of fiery serpents. And there's a lot of death. Did, did you get to the red cow? We did the red cow way long before you got here, buddy. Right. We're, we're done. Okay. We're done. Okay. You, you missed it. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> we got to the red cow. So Moses, so, so. So God tells Moses 
to but do you want to, but did you did you cover the 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 real the 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 machloket regarding the red calf what doesn't make sense about it that's the whole point of of this parsha even being named hukat is because yes. the red calf makes no sense yeah i told them yes that's exactly what what we what we brought up we, we, What's we, the biggest that, that difference the between point. the red calf and the golden calf? Okay, that's what no we're right. going to get there. We're I, gonna I don't get have there. any like okay. I don't have any like expertise like you guys. So I was just I was through that out, you know. So I'm I, we're getting there. I'm I promise. Both you and Aaron, I got to tell you, settle down. I'm getting there. I'm getting it. I'm getting it. I promise. I promise. You know, no disrespect intended. Okay. We, all right. But yes, right. So the red heifer we've already discussed is is like this weird who thought I've talked about the fact that there's these three different types of laws, yada, yada, yada. This is one of them. And now comes another one. OK, so. Fiery serpents. OK, God. I don't, th okay. I don't think you covered it. I don't think you covered it. I did. I promise. I promise. I promise. I don't okay. think you did. <laughs> Let me go on. You can fill in the blanks at the end. OK, because I'm all right. So God tells Moses to create this, like, you know, stick with this copper snake. Okay. Okay. And, and people have already, I saw it in the, in the chat, right? This, you know, where this caduceus, the Asclepius. Okay. And, and, and we'll get there. We'll get there. Hang, hang tight. We'll get there. Okay. So when, the Jewish people are supposed to look at it and see this symbol. They are supposed to be reminded of God, right, and be healed. And if they don't think about God and they, you know, um, then they're supposed to not, you know, it's not effective for them. So, you know, it's kind of a, a sort of lich process, I'll, I'll say. I'll say. I'll just say it's a, a kind of a vague sort of lich process um, with which... I do take a little bit of umbrage because, um, you know, you can say God instructed them to do it and them's the rules, right? You know, them's the rules. But as someone already pointed out, why not a golden calf? Why not a golden calf? Why can't you look at a golden calf and then, and then be reminded of of God. What what why is one idolatry and one not? Why is what why why did God choose not the symbol of the, the oldest symbol of the Jewish people, the menorah? Okay, that's the oldest symbol, right? Not the star of David. David hasn't been born yet. Nah. Okay, so all right, so like all right, so the menorah is the oldest. Um and uh so uh also uh, why did God? Why did God set the plate? Why did He stop the plate? Why? 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 Why with the why with the thing and the post and the thing? Why? Why is it necessary? Well, for well why is what? Why a snake? Why is why, why was why a, snake a snake to deliver? Was was a snake? I'm going to talk about that. Rashi, you're okay, going to make some, you are going to play cleanup. I promise you, because there's some esoteric right. stuff that All I right. know that you know about that word that I don't know. OK, so I, well, I'm counting on you. OK, so the uh, this, you know, I mean, on its surface, it seems like idolatry to me, you know, cursory glance, witchcraft, whatever. I, I read it today. You know, I'm I'm instructed. I'm supposed to think about God when I see this symbol. This is what I'm supposed to be reminded of. And I can tell you. Up until today, up until today, hours ago, until I read that passage, I thought of that symbol. When I saw that symbol, I thought of the American Medical Association logo. And I'm going to tell you why. Of course it is. Of course it is. I'm going to tell you why. Um, um, uh, so... Let, you know, let me tell you about this little history of this little symbol. So there's a lot of confusion about the true symbol of medicine, right? So the single staff, and this is why Aaron is going to play 
cleanup because he knows much more about the word for snake, which around which I know he's frothing at the mouth like a venomous cobra um, to like share with us, which I can't wait to hear. Okay. Um, but like, so the single staff w uh, is the, is with one entwined snake is, is the current AMA logo. Okay. And the history of this symbol, you know, obviously goes back, you know, <laughs> okay, and I never thought about that, right? So many physicians, such as myself, were are un you know are unaware, you know, that there are actually two distinct symbols, right? We've talked about them, and they they get conflated, right? The Asclepius, okay, and which is the singular uh, snake, and I can put that a picture of okay. that one in the chat. I have a picture of them both side by side. So um, Asclepius, which is the singular one, okay, which is the one that is just like Moses. This, that's, there was, he was the god of medicine and the son of Apollo, okay? In, uh, and the god of, of healing, okay? So Asclepius is, is uh, got this branch, representing you know plants and a snake and asclepius is known as this like i said god and his 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 he was killed by his grandfather um uh zeus with a thunderbolt because not not enough people were passing on to the underworld uh due to uh all of his healing skills okay now that other symbol that um, other symbol, the one with the two business, that's the caduceus, okay? And that's Hermes, that's Roman, Hermes, right? Mercury, that's, okay, the messenger of, the, that's a messenger of the gods. And he was known for carrying a staff, uh, this staff of the caduceus, okay? This caduceus. And this included two snakes, two snakes with a set of wings, okay? And uh, it's from the Greek meaning herald's wand. And it's a badge, I would say, of diplomatic ambassadorship. It's associated with commerce, eloquence, alchemy, thievery, and lying. Okay, so, <laughs> so wait a minute. Wait. So the snake's a powerful symbol. In many cultures, Aaron's going to talk about it, right? It, the snake is a symbol of health and healing because it could shed its skin, regenerate itself. The snake produced venoms, all of which had their own medicinal or, or and, and poison properties to be exploited by the physician. And as a physician who's been trained in the art of Western, Western medicine, okay, when I see a serpent on a staff, I'm sorry, I don't think of God. I never did up until today. So this is the reason why you need to learn Torah. Okay. I think of it as a symbol of healing because I'm, I'm a Western physician and I'm trained in the Hippocratic tradition. Okay. The Hippocratic tradition. And it's the symbol of the American Medical Association, Medical Association and the U.S. Air Force. Now, uh, really the Greeks like I think had first contact with the Jewish people around 800 BCE, which would be about like 500 years after this, this thing arrived onto this scene. Okay. All right. Um, and, and this that's introduced in this, in this Parsha and uh, uh, you know, right, right here it's introduced as, a, as, as a, as a symbol of, of healing. And like I said, you know, I didn't, I was, I didn't until today, I, I didn't, I, I, I didn't know. And it's the reason why, like I said, is because I hadn't learned my Torah and I hadn't learned Hebrew and I didn't know those things about Miriam and the permutations of her names and her associations. And this is why you have to learn the language and this is why you have to go deeper and this is why you don't get to just like, uh, trust what some 
Schmendrick, who has edited it 18,000 times, tells you you need to read these things yourself and draw in part your own your own your own conclusions okay so up until today i was an idolater i read the torah up, up until today i looked at that staff and i didn't think of god now now i understand the power of healing comes from god i need to think of god every time i see that and so let's talk about for a second wait how did the staff of Asclepius, I mean, the other one, the Caduceus, is a, is a messenger, has nothing to do with medicine whatsoever. So how the heck did that get us, you know, appropriated into, into medicine? And that, that is a different and interesting story, okay? Um, Hippocrates, okay, the physician, father of Western medicine, okay, 450 to 380 BCE, okay? He was believed to be a direct descendant of Asclepius. Okay. All right. Hold that staff. Okay. Which has now been appropriated from the Jewish people, I think. Hopefully. Okay. You know, the, the, most of you know about the Hippocratic oath, you know, uh, uh, it, the oath actually begins with, I swear by Apollo, the physician and by Asclepius. Okay. So that's, that's oath. Um, uh, uh, so again, how did it become conflated with this caduceus? So uh, up comes the United States Army. Leave it to the army. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, um, in 1902, okay, at the suggestion of, a, a, of an assistant surgeon named Frederick Reynolds, he's a captain, a, a new uniform code is established. And the caduceus became a collar insignia for all personnel from the U.S. Uh, Army Medical Corps. And um, the, uh, the Reynolds correspondence with the Surgeon General's office, it was apparent that he was totally unaware of the distinction between these two symbols, the caduceus and the Asclepius. And he recommended the use of the, because he recommended the use of the cock of Asclepius, okay, uh, uh, but pictured it with, you know, the caduceus, okay? So the statement, uh, uh, you know, was actually noted uh, and, and, and to be er erroneous. Uh, and, you know, they noticed that no other Western military service of that time displayed a caduceus. OK, they all use the staff of Asclepius. OK, the medical associations in Asia, India, Canada, Great Britain, France, Germany, Africa, Scandinavia, all of them staff of, of Asclepius. So where's this caduceus business? <laughs> right. So it's this conflated thing. When Cat in 1902, Captain Reynolds, he suggested the switch to the caduceus symbol, the surgeon the Surgeon General, whose name, name is G.W. Sternberg, G.W. Sternberg, dismissed his request outright. Okay, he was smart enough to understand the difference, and maybe that's why. So, but Captain Reynolds, he was persistent, and later that year, he sent a second letter to the new Surgeon General, General W.H forward guy who clearly doesn't know the history and from this time this proposal was approved on july 17th 1902 what day is it uh what's today's date 16 <clears throat> ninth. ninth it's coming up all right the caduceus of gold was adopted next week there you go the branch uh, uh, was adopted into the U.S. Uh, armed forces, you know, uh, but this, this, it still didn't go unnoticed, okay? In 1917, the, there's a Colonel Mc, McCulloch, the librarian, who, uh, to the Surgeon General, he discovered the original documents and, uh, you know, and he saw the conflation and he lamented the error, he pointed it out, but they decided by that time, 
not going to do anything about it. So the U.S. Army Medical Corps and the U.S. Navy Medical Corps still use the caduceus with the two snakes, okay? And the U.S. Air Force Medical Service uses the staff of Asclepius. My father was in the Air Force, okay? The staff of Asclepius has represented medicine since 800 BCE and clearly before that and very knowledgeable medical authorities, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, understand uh, this. And upon this, we can now agree and go study Torah. And, uh, and, and, and I'm going to invite Rob Aaron to play cleanup and say thank you for giving me this space to go on this long journey. Well, it was great that, that we, we went on that because of what we see is we, uh, it goes back to something that you originally talked about when you first, first had your first conference, which was about the continuum of culture, um, kind of, in, even though it, an adaptation of culture within new culture. So who were we before we were Jews? And I think that's what you, that's what the question you pose. So why do we do the things that we do? Well, the Torah tells us to behave certain ways, but then beyond that, what makes us Jewish? And so we had a culture before we became Jews. And so a lot of what we do as Jews extends from that culture. Well, we so see here, right. And what we see here, I mean, there's, there's clearly... There's, uh, you know, our laws are based on, on Torah, just our secular laws are based on Torah. The laws of tort are based on the laws of Torah. We have this symbol here of healing. It's it's not a, I don't think it's a, a stretch to say that early uh, Christians, <clears throat> they were Jews. And they just believed that Yeshka was the Moshiach. And so mm -hmm. they were reading Torah, and so they would continue to adopt this symbol as a sign of healing. So it just wouldn't be for this Parsha, but it would be a symbol of healing. Uh, Rashi says something interesting about the snake. Why the snake? And, um, you know, the first thing that I thought of is where does the snake first appear in the Torah? And it's really Adam, Adam. Baba, Eve, and mm -hmm. a snake. And that's a cast of characters in the Garden of Eden. That's the cast of characters there. Three. And Hashem, of course. And what Rashi says is the snake who is smitten because of slander, because the, uh, the idea was that the snake lost, it was cursed for what it did, and it was cursed to slither along the ground, not have any legs or anything like that, after it in encouraged Kava to um, eat from the fruit. So because the snake was smitten because of slander, let that snake come an exact punishment from those who slander. So the Jewish people here were slandering Right? They were slandering against Moshe, against God, saying, how did you do this to us? Why did you do this to us? And from, you know, from henceforth, how many times were, were B'nai Israel complaining about their circumstances? And each and every time they complain about their circumstances, it's resolved. Sometimes there's a little spanking that's involved, okay? So, like, you, you get a hit, but it's always resolved favorably. And I think the lesson, there's a continuous kind of struggle here between B'nai Israel and their faith. And that's what this whole, in my opinion, the entire story of B'nai Israel in the desert is one of a challenge of faith with God. And so and we're supposed to, I think, extract from that where we are now. And many of us feel as if we're in a desert. We, we don't feel hey, what's unique about this, what the irony be, behind the desert is God's presence was very, very, uh, uh, very uh, obvious. Mon would fall in the morning 
people didn't have to work. There what was a bunch the, of adventures. There was the cloud. There was the <laughs> there was the fire in the sky. I mean, think about it. I mean, there was it was like magic was there. Hashem's presence was there for everyone to see. When the Torah was given, the mountain goes up, lifts up. Everyone dies because they're so because their souls leave their body and they come back and they say, we can't hear that again. We cannot hear this. Moshe needs to tell us, you know, what the, what the Torah is. So this is the irony, is that even in, under those circumstances where God's presence is so obvious, there's this doubt. So for us, the reason the Torah is here is for, for us to look at this and say, wow, you know, B'nai Israel had a tough time back then when things were so obvious and now when we look around, where do we see God? I mean, you really have to be someone who's looking and aware and believing. Yeah. And it could be the optimism of Miriam, which is why she takes the tambourine, because at any moment you need to be ready for to party, to, to celebrate. As yes. a, to, things can turn on a dime. Speaking of which, by the way, I casted my first pure silver piece of metal just 20 minutes before uh, our Parsha, pure silver metal. And you're, so you're making your own currency now. It's good. Well, you know, amulets. You know, what we got, you know what we got to do? I tell you, we got to get that piece of land, <laughs> carve it out, secede, <laughs> have our own currency. Just, <laughs> well, and, and one can join step a at a time. One step yeah. at a time. And if you want Aaron. to join the cult, there's there's a Swiss bank account. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but but okay. So let's continue with the snake. All right. So for a snake, the exact punishment for the ungrateful. Okay, where one type of uh, the ungrateful, the snake, to a snake, there's no taste for the food. The snake can just, like, devour its food. And look at what the Jewish people are complaining about most often, the food, right? And what, what do Jewish people <laughs> complain about? What are they complaining about? Why is it so drafty in here? We go to a wedding, we complain about the food, right? We go to a bar mitzvah, what do you complain about the food? You go to someone's the seder. The are so small. My God. The, oh, the, the matzo balls used to were, be this big like this. You see the way she makes the matzo balls? They're like rock. You know, <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a constant thing. So, but I think uh, let's, let's, let's break this down with the snake and gazing at the snake. Okay. So on one hand, what Rashi is saying is when B'nai Yisrael looked at this symbol and committed their hearts to Hashem, mm -hmm. there was the healing. Yes. So I think what this is doing is it's a preparation because as Luke pointed out, B'nai Israel already strayed in one sense with the calf and worshiping mm -hmm. the calf as a god. Yeah, this seems very tempting, you know, like a temptation. Yeah, exactly, for exactly. Who is but already different. primed to have but done this, is this what's before. Different. But this is what's different. Right, this time they should think about God. This, this time it's different. The snake is the origin story. The snake is also bit them. The, the snake harmed them. Okay. And the snake came from God to harm them. So the snake is a reminder of Hashem's will and what Hashem's power is. So you're looking at the snake to remind yourself of Hashem's power and Hashem's will on, on those different le levels or those different layers as opposed to B'nai Israel just coming up with the calf, which was already being used by neighboring peoples as as a, an object of worship. So I think... Um, One has an getting... established history with uh, a deity that was already, you know, uh, um, yeah, 
uh, problematic, actually. So, but, uh, you know, I don't know at the time where I, I have to look to see. I don't know what other, if the, what snake deities there were in the area, if that really, I mean, because that would imply that this hasn't been done before. That that explanation implies that there's no associ a prior association with. Yeah, I'm, I'm, sure there, I'm sure there are snake deities. I mean, we know in, in Native American culture there there are snake. Of, there's, of you know, there's there's snake symbols. Uh, well, in yeah, but they didn't get them. Before. Those yes, but that's in isolation, like a Native American that happens over here, right? That's yeah, in isolation. Yeah. Yeah, but the snake story itself, the origin story with the snake was probably shared by other cultures as well. And oh, there probably I and there probably were people who would worship the snake rather than God because they would yeah, say I would agree. Snake is so the, one, the, the snake is the one with the power because the snake was the one who went against God. So I could see I could see a, an ancient people. Of viewing the snake as a, a powerful right? deity. So I think it's a um, sortilege process. I think it's if you look at this and you think of the other deity, you're out. If you look at this and you think of God, you're in. It's a sortilege yeah, exactly. process. Well, right, right, exactly. Because you're healed. And if yeah. you look at it and you're not thinking about God and you're being yeah. distracted by the deity the or the snake, then right. you die. And yeah. so though only those who are holy survive and, and make it through. It's but I just want to touch Yeah. <laughs> but I just want to touch on, on Death uh, Race two thousand. I just want to touch on the last part, okay, which is the or oh, the first part, which is the uh the red cap. Okay. So the the hook, a hook, what it means is a hook is a, a type of law that we don't understand its purpose. So there are three different types of laws in Judaism. One has a common understanding. Uh, another um, is for our spiritual well-being. And we can kind of understand that on a certain level. But then there's another, which is just a complete mystery. Now, the, the hook about in this, what that's what this is. A hook is like a mysterious mitzvah that has, we don't understand why it is the way it is. Here, the ashes for the red calf were prepared by someone. So the red calf was burned and all of it was taken. And the red calf was used to purify someone who was tummy, someone who touched a dead body. You have to turn it up. So the, um, the Kohen would take the ashes and then put them on the person who had touched a dead body. Now, mind you, we're, we're thinking about a time where people really came into contact with dead bodies a lot. I mean, there were battles, okay? And there were battlefields. So you could just be a shepherd and you could have your sheep out there and there would be remains that you Let would me, come across. I, I'll just interrupt. I'll just say in our recent trip through Jordan, we would drive along the highways, and because it is the Semitic people's custom to be in the ground, both Muslims and Jews, within 24 hours, you'd be driving in the desert and look over and see a burial mound, mm -hmm. right? So, and, and not infrequently, right? Because it meant that, like, like mile markers. they were like, my, exactly, people yeah. dropped dead there. And so yeah. that was but, it. But, but more so in the context of the Torah itself, what we're seeing is we're seeing the Jewish people, we're seeing B'nai Israel going through different areas and conquering. And by conquering, what we mean is engaging in warfare. And so people were constantly um, involved in touching dead bodies, coming into contact with dead bodies. What about, there's a, there's a, there's a mission, I was, I was learning this with the rabbi the other day, what happens if you come across an arm and you don't know if the arm, if the person who the arm was attached to is still alive, but you know, it's an arm. Okay. So is that a dead body? Is that considered tame? Is it not considered tame? What if you pick up this arm or you come into contact with this arm, right? Wow. But in any event, um, the, the person who's making the ashes becomes impure 
And the person in the ashes, which is the cleansing agent, purifies the impure person. So how is this possible that the only thing that the person did who's making the concoction is touch a cleansing agent? How can they be impure when they're touching a cleansing agent? They're not touching the impure person. They're not touching a dead body. So how is it that they themselves are impure? So this is the question. It doesn't make any sense, right? Yeah, Kinda it makes does. sense to me. It's called contagious magic and transfer of sin, sin transference. But and no, it, it no, but it isn't. No, but it isn't That's the Kohen. It's the one who's preparing it. I understand who it is. I get if it. If it was, if it was the Kohen, the person who was who was putting the ashes on the person, one might say, okay, well, they're transferring to them. But it's the person who's preparing it. So it's one so step transfer. removed. It's it's one step removed. So, I know, I know. It, so uh, I, I thought of it. I was misunderstanding it before, but it's. Uh, I, I think you're right. There's an energy transfer that's there, and um, you know what it's teaching us is when you're helping others, you have to keep in mind the pureness, the purity of your heart, right? Whenever you're helping others. And sometimes in helping others, you have to go to places where it's not so pure. And you may, in that respect, get some of that schmutz on you. Yeah, okay? And this is why we, 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 we were talking about last week, we're, we, the Parsha, there's a woe to the wicked and woe to, be, to the neighbor. Like, you don't even want to be around because you you know the wicked right or the impure or whatever because it could it could rub off on you yeah right it's, it, yes but 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 here's the thing as jews this doesn't matter as jews we look at this differently um one of the rabbis today in, in synagogue was saying uh, today was a very special day for chabad chasid and it was the yurt site of the lubavitcher rebbe and he didn't have an opportunity to go. But he's a chaplain. He's a prison chaplain. And he said he went into the prison and he and he he consulted with some prisoners. And he said, there I was in a place that's dirty in many different ways. And as Jews, in order for us to spread light and love and peace, you have to go to those places where there is no light and there is no love and there is no peace. And so this is, I think, the ex an explanation that we can read into this is that in order to cleanse, you do have to go to a dirty place. And you have to be very careful when you go there not to pick up some of those, some of those habits when you're going there and you're doing your good deeds. So maybe that's the lesson. But uh, I'm sorry about being late. I was having uh, the nighttime prayers. And no, we uh, love, that's, we love having, having you here. I love it. it. You're, thank you pleasure. for coming. It's an absolute pleasure. So, uh, Lila Tov, everyone. And, um, you know, all of us should think about doing one thing this week where we go to some place that maybe we have to spread some light and some love, and some peace where it may be uncomfortable and to do that and to be proud of it and don't get the schmutz on you. Okay. <laughs> Just don't get, the, don't, don't get that schmutz on you. Okay? Do your best. Do your yeah, best. Do your best. Do your best. Wipe it off. Be a nice person. Wipe it off. Go there. Wipe it off. Right. All right. Go study some Torah. All right. Love you guys. Peace in the Middle East. Amen. Amen. Okay. Amen. Salah. Good night, everyone.